And I don't know about you, but it wasn't one of those things I ever worried about when we decided to move to Boquete. And the gentleman to my left has caused me to really think about things a lot differently. Um, Dr. Byers is a retired geology professor from the University of Wisconsin. He has spent his life learning and teaching about the geology and volcanology and I think you're going to have a wonderful time listening to his presentation today. So without further ado, Dr. Paul Myers. Wow. Well, we have just uh, gotten back in the last couple of days from a trip to the top of Baru. And it was uh, probably one of great experiences. I hope all of you can get there someday, but if you are unable or it's impossible, you think maybe this, uh, this uh, talk today will give you at least some idea of what it looks like up there, what it has looked like in the past and why, and perhaps what might happen in the future and how we should prepare for it. So, I'm going to talk about those things today, probably uh, I hope to answer most of your questions without your asking them, but uh, if at the end you have some residual questions, please, you know, take the time at the end of the talk today uh, to raise your questions, so it's very likely that someone else sitting in the audience would have the same question. But thanks a lot for coming this morning. It's a beautiful day. The mountain was clear today. And it's been clear the last few days. That's nice. And uh, we're looking at uh, uh, hopefully a pleasant future for our dear friend up on the hill there, uh, Grandpa Baru. I hope he's going to sleep for a while. If you could just hold it, okay? So I have a few things here to say uh, and thanks for the people who have helped in the, in the, uh, with all of the, pre the aspects of this presentation. Probably uh, most notable is uh, David Sherrod and his group in USGS who published in 2007 an excellent report that you ought to uh, familiarize yourself with. It can be downloaded in, on your computer even printed, circulated, it's in the public domain, and it, it tells you maybe more than you want to know about what has happened, what could happen with uh, Mokar Maru. So this reference, I uh, put the, the uh, reference in, on the screen. Uh, if you can remember, just U.S. Geological Survey, an open file report, and uh, it starts in the 2007 because that's the year it was published. And so if you uh, go online, you won't have any problem finding it and even downloading it. It's easy to do. Even I did that. So if I can do it, you can do it. And of course, um, my dear friend Lloyd Kreit has been a very constant companion in almost all of my investigations up to this point. Uh, and he's uh, probably going to stay that way if I can keep it that way. <laughs> and I've got to treat him well. He's, he takes a lot of beautiful photographs and all kinds of wonderful things. So, but one of the things that's really a surprise to me and uh, to many of the, the people that I hang out with is that there are so many of you out there. Uh, this is the second time for this thing. And uh, you yes, see, yes, it's going in. So it's surprising. You know, there's obviously a lot of interest in our communities uh, in Volcan Maru, and for good reason. There should be. So, what I'm going to try to do this morning then is to hit the high points and hope that uh, when we return in November, that uh, you can uh, remember that there are, this thing is going to keep on going in the future. We're going to be taking more field trips. I probably will do some more talks. Who knows what? But with an interest like this, it's obvious that we should probably continue things 
when I return in November, we'll keep right on going just like nothing ever happened. Okay? So, with that, uh, I guess we can move on, and I have a few things to say, more or less introducing the topic of why volcanoes happen, and uh, this slide here will help you to uh, get something in mind. Although you probably haven't heard a great deal about it, it is helpful to know uh, something about what's going on down inside the Earth in order to explain what's happening here at the surface. We're, we tend to be surface-oriented people, and we neglect what is happening down under our feet, sometimes way under our feet. But basically, the volcano you are uh, seeing here every day next to you, that volcano is there for a reason. It, it, it just didn't happen. There's a reason, there are reasons why it's there. Volcanoes happen in places where down inside the earth, the rocks inside the earth called the mantle, which is a very dense, dark, heavy rock, starts to melt in places to form magma. Okay? And that magma slowly works its way upward into the upper shell of the earth called the crust and it may punch its way all the way to the surface to make a volcano so uh, the magmas there are different ways in which magma can form and places in the earth where they tend to form and one of those places is along all the edges of continents it turns out uh, that the Atlantic Ocean is growing from the center outwards by spreading away from that center. It carries the continents uh, on, in Europe away from the continents of North America, moving uh, away from the center ridge that is called the Mid-Atlantic Mid Ridge. Okay? That ocean is growing and it's carrying the continent away from that center, okay? So if the Atlantic Ocean <laughs> Basin is growing, we're dealing with a spherical Earth, right? Someplace else, some other ocean is shrinking, and that's the Pacific Ocean, okay? So when a ocean, an ocean basin shrinks, what happens is that the continents uh, tend to be migrated toward it, uh, have no place to go, so that be, be because the ocean floor is gliding down underneath these continents like that, uh, all the way around the Pacific Ocean Rim. Okay, that's called subduction. Okay, the ocean floor is subducted under the continents that are pushing toward the ocean basin. Now, it's a fairly simplified explanation of what, in fact, is a fairly complex process because the ocean base, the ocean floor, is breaking up and it breaks up into pieces, and the pieces move in different directions at different speeds. So it gets a little complicated. So, if I can move this slide, there we are. Oh, lucky. Here we are. This is kind of odd, believe it or not, uh, with a lot of ocean around it. And uh, so what I'm going to do is to uh, show you why uh, Waru is an important place. This piece of, of Pacific Ocean floor, or Pacific Ocean crust, is called the Cocos Plate. That plate is moving toward the north, northwest, or north, northeast, or sorry, uh, fairly fast. And it's, it's gliding underneath Panama, 
toward another continent, a slab of crust moving toward it from the, the um, Caribbean. This is called the Caribbean plate. This is coming this way. All right? We got a collision here. And Panama is right at the site of the accident. Okay? And to make matters more complicated, but you don't need to worry too much about this, there's a, another plate over here, South American plate, which is going this way to the east, northeast at a slower rate. So things get a little complicated. Anyway, you'll notice that this line is called a fracture zone. It's where two pieces of crust are moving along beside each other at different speeds and different directions. Okay. So what happens then when you extend this line, Baru is right there. <laughs> right on the projection of this fracture zone. And there's a lot going on right here at the border between Costa Rica and Panama. A lot of stuff. It's, 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 a, it's an accident zone. It's the best way I can uh, tell you what it is like. It's like a multiple car accident on a major highway. You get two cars, a truck and a car collide, and then they, they form a barricade and then other cars and things crash into it. You get the idea? So it's sort of an accident zone. Yeah. So, <laughs> that we won't go any further, right? It's just sufficient to, to let you know that it's pretty complicated here and uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of things moving around. Okay. Oh, I'm going back. I can't see it from the light. Sorry about that. Can't see it. Okay. Uh, so we've said something about magma, right? It's molten rock. It comes from down deep in the mantle. And it comes up in different ways in different places, and we won't get into all of that. But basically, the, 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 the magma that we're talking about is called andesite. Got that? Let's hear it. Andesite. Andesite. After the Andes Mountain. Got that? That's very important. Andesite and basalt and rhyolite are the three major forms of mag types of magma. All right. Basalt is like what you see in Hawaii. It's black and it flows real easy and smooth. That's not what I'm going to you, How many of you have been to Hawaii? Oh yeah, you know that, right? So basalt is an oceanic volcanic rock. Form more or less in isolation within an ocean basin, usually. Not only. Rhyolite is almost exactly the tectonic opposite. It forms by melting of the upper crust, the continent crust. You know what I mean? The continents are lighter weight, lighter colored rocks that flow on top of the other stuff. Okay? So the rhyolite, where you would see that is in Yellowstone Park. That's why it's called Yellowstone. It's a rhyolite, very light color. Okay? So andesite is in the middle, and it forms where the, uh, the subduct, subduct, subducting ocean plate is gliding under the continent here, well, we say underneath the uh, Panama, for example. And so now, the, that the plate starts to melt and forms a magma which rises up into the base of the continental crust where it gets contaminated by crustal material. So it's a, it's a mixture of oceanic, it's like taking a mixture of basalt and rhyolite, what you get is in the middle, that's an atmosphere. Okay? So it's a light gray to medium gray rock 
for about three hours, and I won't go into that. Okay, so andesite is the stuff that we get at my roof, and almost everything that you see anywhere around Bocante is andesite. I don't know what it's the boulders, all the boulders, this, all, the, all the stuff they use for cement, concrete, is andesite in some form or another. Okay, we're stuck with it. Okay. So, how do we date a volcano? Now that's tricky. Well, you've got historic records, right? So, uh, we go back in, in history and we find that the last eruption historically was about 500 years ago. Plus or minus, you know. It's about that, about 500 years. Now the average time between eruptions is around 400 apparently. Between 400 and 500. So at the present time, from a statistical standpoint, we're overdue, statistically. But that's only a statistic. Don't worry about it. So, <laughs> there have been four eruptions in the last 1,600 years, and if you divide that out, you get about 400 years. The methods of determining geologic history of volcanoes, when we get back into its older history, gets a little trickier. It turns out that uh, Volcano Baru is at least 400,000 years old. Less than half of one million years. And now, being a geologist, I start out my geology classes at the university by getting people to start thinking in terms of plus or minus a million years or 10 million years. We throw time around like the national budget. <laughs> So, uh, so uh, less than one million years, you know, Baru is a youngster, basically speaking, from a geologic standpoint. Now, when I'm working in Wisconsin, I'm mapping rocks that are 1,800 million years old and older. So, this is, this is truck soup for me, all right? Okay. Then we can use a lot of other things, including of uh, a carbon dating, which is very important, especially for younger volcanics like Baru. The, the stuff that is deposited around the volcano as it grows, and much of it buries forests and things like that. Okay, so this is organic debris, plant debris mostly, which uh, decays uh, at a fixed rate. Uh, the carbon-14 uh, decays, it's like uranium, it is radioactive in a sense, and so we can actually determine the age of plant materials that are buried with volcanic ash and the ash. You understand? Okay? Yeah. Okay. So there are ways of getting at a, at a number for the age of various volcanic events using these dating techniques like that, like carbon-14. Okay. So that's how we build the history and how we have some idea of the frequency of the eruption. We know the stuff is andesite. So now we start putting it into a category. We start getting some statistics and some data and pretty soon uh, things begin to make more sense. Okay. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because it looks like, it looks like a, a sort of a moldy fried egg, doesn't it? Well, that's, that's my thought anyway. You can have your own particular uh, hang up on that. But this is the summit of, of Volcan Baru right here. Okay? And you'll notice that the, the volcano is surrounded by these black fault zones that mark the edge of what we call a caldera. C A L D E R A. The caldera is a collapse zone. Uh, in the center of a, a volcano. It is produced because the, vo the, the magma that is spread out all around the countryside here, all the way down to the Pacific Ocean on the south, is 
and all over around, uh, around us here at Volcanic. Uh, so uh, this stuff, the volcanic derived materials have come from a source point at the vent, which is very small, from a column of magma that uh, was, came up through the crust and was, uh, was actually extruded, blown out of the surface. So what happens, you don't have it, you don't, when, when you get an eruption of a volcano, it doesn't leave a hole down in the mantle someplace. That's impossible. The mantle rocks flow in to take its place, and so on. So, and so as, as a result though, the, uh, and when in the, in the shallower parts of the volcano, uh, it, there, there are open spaces that are formed by the release of the magma at the, at the, at the top, at the surface, and that leaves uh, a pressure differential which the thing naturally collapses to fill the space formerly occupied by the magma. Okay? So the caldera is nature's way of compensating for the loss of magma at depth. Okay? So there, this is one. There's actually several other larger faults that are more or less concentric around that center. Uh, so that means, uh, for one thing, that the, the actual conduit for the magma coming up to the center of the volcano, to the vent, uh, is fairly small. But the, 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 the place where it comes from down underneath could be much larger. But in any case, the caldera is part of the volcanic structure, and uh, you can see that when you drive up there, because the road goes right up along the edge, right along this uh, caldera fault right here. There are other places where you can see the caldera rim here, in this river valley, and other, in other places where they're not, not even on the map. So, uh, but these colors represent different kinds of rocks, different ages of rocks, uh, different types of uh, different origins of the material based upon a uh, field study. So this is the map that was produced by the U.S. Geological Survey in their and is, is contained in their publication, the special paper of 2007. Very good. But if you go up there, it would be smart. Download this thing, take it up with you, and maybe you can see see what's going on uh, as you go. Okay. Okay. You've seen this picture, have you not? Or something like it in a little science textbook someplace. The, the, the cross section of a volcano, right? This is what they should look like, right? Well, you'll notice there's sort of a difference between our volcano and this one. And one of the most notable differences, of course, is the fact that we have a truncated a volcano. We've got the lower part of it. We don't have any of the superstructure at all. Where is it? <laughs> it's all around you. <laughs> it's in the streets of Bogotá for a while. But then it, <laughs> and it blows around. <laughs> okay, so uh, lots of things are happening when a volcano erupts. Here's the magma chamber down here, as I've said, and the conduit here, the vent here. But normally in just imagine that our vent is right down here someplace, uh, and that uh, most of the material that was in this upper part of the volcano has been blasted away during eruptions. A lot of it goes up in the cloud and falls as ash instead of coming out as lava flows. One of the things you don't see very much of in Baru is um, lava flows. So, one thing you don't have to worry about is when uh, uh, Maru erupts, you're not going to get buried under a lava. Doesn't that make you feel good? Yeah, I bet. There's all kinds of other things, though. That's sort of what I'm really sorry, but you know, for every good good story, there's another one not for good. Okay. Now, during the eruption, large boulders and fragments that are broken loose uh, as the magma forces its way through the lower part of the, of the cone 
is older volcanic materials volcanic solidified are broken loose and carried out as bombs and big huge boulders sometimes red hot uh, they'll fall on the side of the volcano and go wham you know and make a sparks go all over the place way better than fireworks <laughs> There's a volcano near Guatemala City called Pacaya. Are any of you familiar with Pacaya? And it's, it's, it's beautiful. If you go to Guatemala City, you don't miss it. But it, you can't because it's right out there and it's erupting all the time, pretty much. So we climbed it and did a lot of other things. But uh, it, um, it erupts on huge amounts of black ash like this. And, uh, but also, there are these types of flows and, and avalanches and so on that also come down the sides of the volcano. Not only can the volcano erupt here, but we can get what we call a flank eruption on the side. And, and it may actually pop out on the side someplace and come roaring down. But if that happens, they're going to get magma much more directly from the magma chamber and it comes directly out on the side of the volcano. It has not had this long transport all the way to the top. So it's different from the stuff that comes out of the top. Okay, this is uh, called a pyroclastic flow. And I bring your attention to this one because it's probably one of the most dangerous of the, uh, of the, 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 the types of eruption of any volcano. And andesites typically form this type of so-called pyroclastic flow. Pyro, hot, plastic, broken. It's broken crystals and glass and stuff. It comes out at a temperature of about a thousand degrees centigrade. Now that's more than cookie temperature. This is, this is really, really, it's, a, it's incineration hot. That hot. It's incineration hot. It travels up to 60 miles an hour down the valleys and to the side and uh, it can move a long distance. Now, some of the uh, pyroclastic flows in, in New Mexico and uh, Nevada have traveled over 200 miles. And so that's a lot. That's a lot of ash for one. But okay. Then there are there are all kinds of other things uh, where you get landslides of various types on the on, on the side of the volcano. And you get what we call laharic flows. Lahars are volcanic mudflats. So what happens, you don't see that too much here in this illustration, but a major component of the eruption is water as steam. And the steam rises in a, in a big pile of dark clouds around the ascending column of ash. And you get this condensation of the steam as it rises in the air, and it forms thunderstorms, thunder clouds, lots of lightning all around. So boy, I'll tell you, an eruption is really like God's thunder, boy. I mean, it's really awful sort of stuff that is. But anyway, what happens then when you combine ash that's falling and water is but, right? but, and mud, loose mud can move pretty fast sometimes, especially if it's got a lot of water in it, and it can carry boulders the size of a house very perfectly easily. Now you people, I, I was t telling my wife this morning, we should probably call Bocchetti Boulder City. <laughs> because and almost half of them are in, in our streets, right? Or in the road up to, up to uh, Baru Summit. Anyway, these, these, these materials move very quickly into valleys and down the valleys. And the, the, some of the mud flows, if they're really wet ones, will go for miles and miles. Some of them that we've seen evidence for in over near Volcan have traveled over 20 miles to give you an idea. So some of this stuff is really sort of uh, big. But when a, when a volcano is, is about to erupt, the magma pressure inside the volcano makes it swell up like a blister. 
and the swelling changes the slope angle on the volcano. This is what happened at Mount St. Helens, 1980, uh, when a whole section of the north face of uh, St. Helens broke loose and slid on this steepened gradient uh, into the lake and elsewhere. And it, it exposed the magma directly, which exploded out to the side of the volcano, carrying huge fragments of the uh, older volcanic uh, material with it, leaving a it looked like a, somebody's uh, somebody's rotten tooth, you know, uh, it, a bad, horrible looking cavity on the north face that was made when the stuff slid out. That opens the, the magma uh, reservoir directly and it explodes, forming pyroclastic flows and huge blood flows. So, but basically, uh, I've been taking field trips around here. So we've taken three of them so far, and we, we'll, we plan to continue those next November and beyond. And so we'll uh, go and look at these things in the field, and you, you can see these. Uh, most of the stuff we see around Bukete are lahar, mud flows of various kinds. You can get them almost total boulders. Some of them are silty and sandy. Uh, they depend, and of course, almost always they contain fragments of volcanic rock. Okay, so much for uh, the mechanics and structure of a volcano. We had the good fortune a few days ago to go to the summit via this road. I'm using the word road a little loosely here. <laughs> Very loosely, especially right up here, you've got to use four-wheel drive to get up this park here to the towers, which are the big uh, transmitter towers uh, in a row along the top of that ridge there. Okay. And so, but down here, there is a crater, which you can see right about there. I can, I can see it halfway here, but I, I think you can probably see it better out where you are. But there's a crater there, and then right here there's a lava dome that grew beside that crater during one of the eruptions. But that's at least one major eruptive center of bottom right there, only about what a half a mile or less from all those radio towers. Think about that when you erupt all your radio communications all along the tower. Okay. Okay. And this, I, I'm not going to spend much time on it. I thought you might be interested to see this. This is uh, this is the, the, the city of Oak Now, here in the valley, you're looking southwest from the summit where the radio uh, transmitter towers are. This thing here is the lava dome, and this. See the stripes on the side of the hill there? And if you see the edge of the lava dome right there, there's a trail coming up the valley and going up that, that contact zone. These are older volcanics here, and there's the crater right there. See the edge of it? Just over the, the top of the dome. You'll notice that the top of the dome is all red because uh, the uh, fumaroles and so on that were coming up through the that very hot uh, lava and so on, as it was cooling, uh, a lot of water and so on. It makes steam clouds and all this stuff, and it alters the volcanic rocks right at the surface. Anyway, that's, that's the vet area right there. Yeah, now, now you've had your trip to the summit of uh, Baru, okay? That's about all you're going to get from me right now. Okay. Uh, thanks. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks. Sorry, but uh, these, with these lights, I can't see. Okay, I need a light. Okay. This is a view of uh, Baru from uh, near uh, Wakat and a huge what they call a debris avalanche 
you came down this valley right here and out toward you. I imagine that coming at about 20 to 25 miles an hour at you. It's about uh, 100 feet deep, thick. And on the top are huge boulders that are just carried from way up into that area. And the, uh, this, this debris avalanche happened uh, quite a long time ago, but uh, the city of Volcan uh, sits on this huge deposit. It goes at least to the Pan American Highway and probably down to the south. We don't know if it went to the Pacific, but it's possible. So big things happened about 40,000 years ago. Yeah. And this is what the a volcano looked like prior to that debris avalanche. Okay? This is where the top was. And all that stuff came right down this valley and out where you out here. That, this is part of what went up there. Okay. Uh, well, um, basically, um, the volcanic process is what we call constructional, right? Uh, that is to say, it builds up on the surface from the walls. And uh, the destructional processes are uh, like erosion of various types, by streams and so on. Uh, so these two competing processes are at work. So when you see that the area is high, has been uplifted, is mountainous and so on, it is probably due to constructional processes. Areas near the sea, sea level are probably uh, not so. Lava flows are emitted where lavas come right out of the surface and flow, but we do not see that very much with Baru. It's really not an important factor for this volcano. Uh, but pyroclastic flows, when you go on that field trip with me and take you to, sh to see one, some of you have already been there and seen this, and uh, it's quite a sight, very interesting. Uh, it ends right at the so-called climbing rocks along the Caldera River. You're maybe familiar with that. Everybody goes out there to climb the rock. But uh, uh, ash falls and debris avalanches and so on represent the solid movement of materials or the liquid light movement of flow materials uh, with or without huge boulders and so on. So, and then of course, what's happened here a lot in Bocete, the Bocete area, is that, uh, that these old mud flows have been cemented together in the weathering process. Water moves down through these old mud flows, so let's say a stack of them, several hundred feet, I think. The water moves through that and cements it, and it makes it like concrete. That's why you coming down the hill into Bucate from almost anywhere, you're going to see these steep canyon walls, almost vertical in some place. Well, they are vertical in some places. Very steep canyon walls. I mean, you, you try to build a house out of soft materials, uh, like a cheap con concrete that's it, uh, too loose or whatever, and what happens? It, 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 will, it, 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 it tends to fall down. It makes a pile of new stand. So, uh, what heck, if this material that we have around us, these old mud flows have been cemented, so they're actually like concrete. And that's why these valleys around us, the canyons around us, are, are going to stay here right where they are for a long, long time into the future. Okay, because and whenever there's an eruption, that's where the mud flows go, it's where the pyroclastic flows go, it's where everything goes into the valley, right? Or the canyons. So it's a sort of a, a fossilized drainage system that we're dealing with. Okay? Yeah. Okay. To give you a chance to actually look at the stump. This is a uh, this is a bunch of ash falls. See the stuff, the ashes and layers, see it? Not different colors, different sizes of material, but there's hardly any boulders in it at all. 
I don't know whether you can see over here, this one, I'll show you one that's better in a second, but uh, and the har, which is mostly what we're dealing with right around us here, has yeah, got chunks of, angular chunks of what we brought to me. This is the remains of a pyroclastic flow, and these column-like forms are formed by a rapid cooling of that ash flow, uh, and it makes these um, it breaks into these column-like forms as it contracts during cooling. You understand a little bit? So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a contraction feature in a, 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 any kind of a flow that cools really fast. Okay, that little flow down the valley, a former over there now. Now, this is a lahar. A good one. I'm not going to go and show you a whole building more, but this, this is, you see, what we're, uh, the roots don't count, okay? <laughs> they're not part of the well, heart. They're, they're post the heart. But, you do see these pieces of rock. Notice that they have sharp edges and corners, right? They're not round like boulders at least, right? They're, they're angular. See how angular they are? There, there's no sorting, there's no layering in it at all. It's all mixed, all big ones and little ones, all in a mud matrix. So it's 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 a it's obviously flowed like that in the stuff that just simply solidified in that form. So the, the, the mud flow picks up all the stuff that's on the surface, including houses, whatever, and uh, then they end up in there like that. It's like a concrete wall, isn't it? Here's another one. Now, you notice that you can see layering in there, can you? See it? Well, you can see that this stuff up here is coarser, has bigger stuff in it, right? And you notice the big ones and the little ones are all mixed together, right? So this is a lahar. You can see the edge of that one right there. And there's another lahar underneath it. But down below here, you get some fine stuff that layered in here. This is ash flow stuff. Okay? But what you can get, you can get solid mud, you get mud plus rocks, mud plus, plus boulders, you can get all kinds of mixtures depending on where it has flowed and how far. So, go ahead. Well, maybe you've seen this quarry that's up on Vulcan, Vulcan Tito Road. Uh, are near that, and uh, the quarry stone there. Notice that the wall that they quarry is vertical, okay? And it's not falling apart, it's not falling down very much. You get some boulders that fall out of it. But look at these big boulders, they're still stuck in there. It's actually like concrete. So when they dig that stuff, this excavator here can barely manage to do it. In some places they, they had to blast some places, but basically it's, it's really hard, hard rock. So it was deposited as mud flow. These are our Lahari's in here. Big boulders and little boulders, some angular, some round, all mixed in together. When these boulders, uh, here is one of the boulders that has a rind on it, of uh, iron oxide, which is sort of orange, you see that? That was in the top of a lahar that was weathered for a long, long time in the soil. Then it was picked up and reincorporated in another mud flow. So the, the, we're constantly, the, the lahars are constantly recycling old boulders. And once a boulder, always a boulder. <laughs> You can see the, the color of this, the soil has developed in a lahar, it has a big boulder in it, but it's all oxidized, the uh, red iron oxide, weathered to a soil. Okay, so let's go on now. I'm not going to skip that one, we, we, we'll go to it. I get carried away sometimes, guys, I'm sorry. Okay, one of the things that's really, really, really important today is the warning signs that we normally use to give us an indication of will it erupt, when will it erupt, we can make some predictions, and so on. And what are the warning signs? 
One is earthquakes, shallow earthquakes, like the ones we've had recently, uh, right at, uh, with, a, with an epicenter right at the, at the vent in, in Bauru. Uh, and it was a 6.3 on the Richter scale, and uh, later on, a little lesser one. But the, those shallow earthquakes tell us a lot about where the magma is feeding the volcano and, and so on. Next. We're going to, oh wait, I'm going to get gas emissions. Uh, if, you, if, if, we're, if, you, if you smell hydrogen sulfur, uh, it smells like rotten eggs, right? If you smell it some morning when you get up and you see, you look up at Port Maru and you see steam and stuff in the air, there's something happening. Okay. <laughs> the, the cone of the volcano swells and increases the, the, the slope angle where we get slides and we get unusual changes in the groundwater system. Boy, we've been having that lately, haven't we? Uh, we won't go into that. Okay, that's lots of lots of science. Now, this is a, taken from uh, Hunter Mule Road. I think, yeah, it was. And you'll notice that here is our volcano. See the bottom of it? There's the slope of the volcano, and the rest of it was up there somewhere, right? And it's gone. So this jagged edge is what we all were left with. The vent, the, the towers are right about in here, and the vent over here is also probably another uh, vent area over here on the far side or where Exodus, oh, this is the big fault, the, 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 uh, the caldera fault. Okay, then you notice that there's, there's a surface here. See that surface right here? That's Boquete. Okay. okay, and you'll see the way we have that surface has been cut by a canyon with very steep walls all up in the air. Okay, so that is, the, all of these are lahars, almost all of them are lahars that were just cut. Mud floors that came from quite a long time ago from Baru, building up a rampart of lahar material uh, on the slope. So part of the base of the volcano has actually been buried by some of these lahar. See? There's more to the volcano actually underneath these uh, underneath these lahar. Then we gotta look, this valley here is the Caldera River, right? And there's the vent right there. Now let's say you have an eruption in the wet season. So that instead of the winds coming this way, right to left, if there are any winds, they may flow from the Pacific this way. What happens in that case? Well, the cloud rises this way, and the ash goes down this way. If, if, if that could, could happen, it could happen. I'm not saying it's going to, but it is a possibility. So anyway, uh, this is one of the reasons why I take people up here to see this because the story is written right there in the landscape. You can see it for yourself. It doesn't take a genius to figure it out. It's, it's pretty much right there before your very eyes. Basically, though, uh, what I'm saying is that 
living with a volcano, on a volcano, next to a volcano, that has shown activity uh, up to the present time, leaves us with an unalterable responsibility of, first, learning as much as we can about it, secondly, learning how to deal with it safely as a community, and uh, then uh, not worrying too much about some devastating thing that's going to happen to me because I wasn't there when that damn thing erupted. You're, you're going to know probably years in advance uh, that it's about to erupt. Okay? You don't have to sell your house today for next week. <laughs> okay? It's not that big a deal. But this, an eruption could happen in the future, and it's not typical of most communities or countries or whatever communities to make wise, corrective, uh, uh, take actions long in advance of something they know is bound to happen in the okay? Like, the flooding of the Mississippi River as another example. Okay. So, uh, what I'm saying is that uh, as a community, I appeal to you to please take this sort of thing seriously as a possibility, learn about it, and then act accordingly as a community. So, that's what when I come back here in the fall, uh, Lloyd Cripe and others will be with me. And we're going to start taking field trips and learning more and more about our old granddad up there. Try to figure out what he's going to do next and when, as best as we can. Learn more about it so we're even better prepared when, if, if it does happen that he wakes up. Okay, so I think I'm going to actually conclude the lecture right there. I'm sorry, but uh, we we had a follow up or something. Something has happened to the computer. Uh, I I really don't have to have it anymore. I think you've actually seen what you need to see in order to make good decisions. Uh, so when we come back in the fall, this is my wife Wealthy right here. So hopefully we'll both be here. <laughs> and uh, but we, we plan to continue this activity uh, next fall. And we welcome you to become part of our group. We're going to learn all kinds of things about this place that you can't possibly imagine. Uh, probably. But anyway, uh, I'm going to turn it over now to question from the audience, and Phil here and, uh, and Sheila are going to be moving around with the uh, microphones. Okay, over here please. Hi, great talk of course, as usual. Uh, we live on a fault in British Columbia. My question for you, and I think I know the answer already, is, is there an evacuation plan? And given there's only one road out of here, and if not, what can we do to help force the creation of an effective evacuation plan? Okay, uh, that's, a, that's of course a perfectly logical question and a good question. And uh, the answer is, uh, you, you all here are going to answer that question. I cannot answer that question alone. I would say that uh, I could make some statements as to what you might try to do. And we've got a plan, sort of, in mind. Uh, that is first, one of the things we need to do is to do a geologic map of the area outside the area that was formerly mapped by the USGS in 2000 and published in 2007. They only mapped to the Caldera River. They didn't map anywhere east of that, up in Howard York. You know, they, they didn't get up there. They were only in the field 14 days. They did that. All that work in just about two weeks. But that shows you how much, look at the, look at the, the manpower, person power that we have right here in this 
in this audience this morning. This evening. And there's a lot of things we could and should do if we're responsible for this. That, I think, is to make a plan and start with a geologic map, start by doing or becoming familiar with uh, Baru in all the various ways, and uh, then at the same time uh, mobilizing uh, the human elements of it to have real preparation, a real warning system that works, that we rehearse every week or every periodically. It's something we keep doing for forever in terms of sitting on a human scale. Okay? Um, rehearse, rehearse a warning system. Secondly, we, we need to know how much to work, how do we, do we need to evacuate? If so, when, how, and so on. Work out some kind of a plan. I'm, my personal opinion, and I may be way off the track, I don't really know. Yeah, maybe sometime we will, but there's a good chance that we're going to have a mud flood, a big one coming down the Caldera River one these days. Typically these things are at least 100 feet deep and sometimes up to 300 feet. Some of the mud flows coming down the Tudor River and off of the Mount Rainier in Spokane and Tacoma, those, those uh, mud flows were 600 feet deep individual flows. To give you some idea of scale, Okay, so we're not playing little games. You know the, the relief of the of the city of the the, the, the city of Bocchetti has probably a, a vertical depth of what? A couple hundred feet, maybe. But I would say, well, if you're gonna do do an evacuation, I would say first and foremost, get to high ground. <laughs> yeah. But beyond that there's other things. Yes. Uh, professor, uh, most of us know superficial stories about Krakatoa and Vesuvius. And many have toured Vesuvius, I'm sure, and caught Romans in the lava flows. What were the three most dangerous eruptions that we have had historically? Historically, probably Krakatoa in the uh, uh, Sea area between Java and Sumatra is the biggest one ever in recorded history. Probably another one in the Mediterranean. Uh, what's the name of the island? The Greek island in the, in the, in the Mediterranean that blew up. You, can, you can see the see the caldera today as a rim under the water in the Mediterranean. And uh, there are, oh geez, I don't know, there's hundreds of others. Santorini, yeah, that's it. Yeah. And then uh, in, the, in, in Central and South America, I don't know. I don't think I have one that I can refer to the break off of that. But. Um, yes. I know that there are, I think it's four volcanoes here in Panama, or is it five? Well, and I'm, I'm wondering of those volcanoes, is Maru among the oldest or the youngest? It's the youngest. It is the youngest. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Baru is the youngest volcano in Panama. That, that, there is no, no question of okay. But how many volcanoes? Well, it's my contention that the, the Cordillera up here uh, north of us is nothing but a whole stack of old volcanoes up there. Okay. So how many volcanoes? Maybe hundreds. Well, well, I, I know they've got four or five named uh, the, ones. The, the more recent ones, and, yeah. yeah. The more recent ones will look like volcanoes, but the older ones don't. They're buried amongst the, in the forest. You don't see them. I thought there was seven. <laughs> <laughs> I've been told by other geologists that there's a, a chain of seven major volcanoes between here and, say, Panama City. And one of the most major ones is El Valle. I don't know if oh, you've yeah, ever been Valle. there, no, but El Valle is the is the base of a former volcano, which stri oh, yeah. spreads for miles. And it. and I think that what's ever happening between here and El Valle is probably, as I've been told, a, a chain reaction thing that will eventually happen. Oh, that I think. Uh, uh, the chain reaction that 
can't, is an oversimplification. I'm sorry to say. But uh, uh, chain reaction gives you uh, the, the misconception of, a, of, a, of an orderly sequence in one direction. And that's nothing like that. There, the, uh, there are places like in Idaho, uh, oh, north, northwest of uh, Yellowstone Park, where the, it looks like somebody shot holes in the, in the surface, and the volcanoes uh, get older. It's a whole series of volcanoes with uh, Yellowstone at the present location. And that's, in a sense, like a chain reaction. It's a hot spot burning holes through a crust that's moving over the top. But that's a fairly rare thing. What we're dealing with here is a, sort of a, almost a random uh, uh, sh you know, shooting gallery type of thing. So uh, it's hard to say. But until you actually map those rocks up here in the mountains and know specifically what they are, where they are, and so on, you can't say it, make statements like that. You can't do it. Nobody can. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go back to my first interview. I'm going to go back to my first interview. I'm going to go back to my first interview. I'm going to go back to my first interview. Yes. I'm going to go back to my first interview. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. I'm trying to keep it. No, you're still my phone. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious about the focus point coming in from the West. You said it's moving relatively fast. Uh, is that like... Uh, yeah, the Cocos plate you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. And the Atlantic plate coming in from the other side, they're going to collide probably somewhere around That's right. this area. That's right. That's right. Is that going to create, uh, in all likelihood, a new Andes issue? Or is it going to segment the North and South continent because of it. Well, uh, I can't fully answer your question except to say that when you take the fracture zone that comes, the Pacific fracture zone is heading right for Baru, okay, but it, we don't, it's not moving along uh, the action. The fault stops because uh, of the different vector movements of the, of the plate. But what happens to the uh, Cocos Plate, as soon as it hits Panama, it bends directly along the coastline. Well, there's all these things are happening, it makes it very complicated. I'm sorry, but I haven't had enough chance to study it, and I, I don't know that it ever has been deeply studied, but that's another thing we're going to be doing as a group. So, I have two questions for you. One is, uh, next fall, when you start yes. up your groups again, uh, you will be publicizing when you're doing Oh, that. absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and and okay. do you go up in four-wheel vehicles, or is there a lot of hiking involved when you do that? On the field trips? Yes. Uh, I make them uh, different, different uh, but Mostly, I try to make them so that you just get out of the car and look at what's to be seen. Thank you. <laughs> and also, well, on one more point, we also scheduled rest stops in the tour. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, my, my really? Second, I have a second question. Yeah. I have a second question. Uh, when this famous incident happens, what do you predict in terms of the amount of time it takes for the, for the actual for, eruption? Yes, yes. Okay, that's a very good question. And actually, nobody really knows for Baru how that, how that volcanic cycle actually happened. But if we study other similar volcanoes and we have their records, we can make some comparisons. And so what, what normally happens is something like this. First, we get steam and gas coming out, and then the eruption. Usually it's a fairly small one. It will be right confined almost entirely to the summit area. In that eruption, mostly what you're going to get is some very sticky lava flows. Okay? But then they will congeal in the vent. Those lava flows will congeal in the vent. 
plugging the vent. Now you plug the drain, and boy, things that now are going to happen. So the next one is probably going to be a big plugger. You know, it's going to go way up in the sky like the one that's showing the back. So, but you'll have some warning, lots of warning. Okay, so you don't have to start running. But then after that, generally the, the, the height of the peak slowly decreases until it becomes what we call dormant. Who is to say what's active and who is what's dormant? Then how Baru has proven in the past that it's, it, it is alive down there. So we have to take that into account. Have I answered your question? Thank you. Hello. Thank you for the thank you for the presentation. Yes. Since you mentioned Yellowstone, do you foresee there being a major eruption in the next century or so in the Yellowstone area? Because I've heard that's a huge that's waiting to happen. <laughs> I'd answer your question. Uh, I could go in further, but the chances of something happening uh, of the magnitude you're visualizing from the movies that you've seen and so on, they love to do these wonderful stories, don't they? Sells a lot of, sells a lot of TV and all that advertising. But in the, the truth of the matter is you can go to Yellowstone safely the rest of your life and your grandchildren's life probably. You don't have to worry about it disappearing. It's going to be there. And you better, no, just go and enjoy it, though. It's, it's a really great place to see. I used to lead field trips at least twice a year to Yellowstone. So I got really used to bear jams and all that. <laughs> yeah, someone, somebody had a question. Yes. Yeah. Is it on? Yes. Yeah. It's it's on. On. Oh, there go. You're there. Hello. Okay. Um, you mentioned um, the volcanic reaction that would happen if the wind was coming north. Up. Yeah. Yeah, now if it's coming from the Pacific, or I'm sorry, from the Caribbean, um, like it is you know, now, it's crazy. We're probably going to get it in Volcan. In Volcan? Yeah. So it will go that way. Go okay. so the other way. Yeah. As they have in the past. <coughs> See, most of, if you notice, if you take, remember the, the, the uh, geologic mapping? It was like a big oval. It wasn't a circle, was it? It was stretched out toward the south southwest. The reason for it is that the dominant wind direction through the whole history of eruptions, at least modern history, is uh, from the northeast to the southwest. Uh, so the ash goes that way, everything goes that way, so you build up these big deposits in that direction. You understand? So, but, I, but I'm saying, st statistically speaking, there's bound to be exceptions in time. You know, there's no reason why we couldn't have a, an eruption during the wet season, right? That's almost half the year of it, if I understand it. <laughs> I have it here, but, am I right? Okay. So. Well, we do suffer a lot of north winds even in the wet season. We have a lot of north, north activity. But. That's right. But I, I just have one more question, and nothing to do with volcanoes exactly. It's like the, the Teutonic plate is what I think is the Cocos plate. And those plates are near Punta Borica. That's right. And, and, and I'm under the understanding that there's only several points similar to that in the world. And what we have at that particular point is a release of the pressure. When we have an earthquake, we have earthquakes mainly come from Punta Borica. And when, when the plates collide, and I guess, one from the north and one from the south collide, that's when we have a pressure release which keeps us safe here from large volcanoes and large earthquakes. But well, that's sort of a multiple question, right? I'll work on it. I think basically to try and answer it as simply and briefly as possible, uh, the best we could say is that at the present time, there has not been anywhere near enough on the ground mapping uh, or seismic study yet uh, to be certain of any conclusions about specific movements or uh, connections between some certain earthquakes and movement vectors and so on. That's something that's coming in the future and we'd love to have you working on that. That would be great.
I think that the U.S. Geodetical Service has done a lot more work here in the past than than than, than, than we know. I think if you look back over the last hundred years, you'll see that U.S. GS was actually here and did a lot of there's a lot of survey points even on top of the mountain long before 2007. Yeah, well, the survey points are not geology. No, but they have been there. So, yeah, so well, that could be. Uh, my question is more about the present, trying to figure out something in the future. Yeah. At the top of your presentation, you mentioned a lot of radioactive material that comes out from the volcano. Oh, well, that, that's not really... Uh, Radioactive. Basically, the carbon is in the, the plants, and it's assimilated by the plants. Okay, all kinds of carbon. There are carbon isotopes, and carbon-14 is one of those isotopes of carbon. That one decays radioactively through time, quite quickly, but it is in the atmosphere that you're breathing very highly dispersed but the plant collects it and when we run the analysis of the plant we may have only a, a million microgram of the actual uh, carbon okay? but that's sufficient that tiny amount is sufficient for the type of analysis that is being run to, to come up with some estimate of age okay Thank you for that. Yeah, I, where I was thinking of going with this question was more about uh, health implications of those types of materials that might be in our soil or in our water, like radon, for instance, which in California is a big issue. Yeah. Well, I'm, I guess I'm not prepared to deal with uh, trace elements in, in the groundwater or our surface water here. Uh, although I've had, had that experience in the past with my colleagues in, in Wisconsin and elsewhere, uh, it's not something that is uh, in, the, in the line of our topic today. I could talk to you about it privately, but I don't have to spend time for that. We, we have run out of time once again, but Dr. Myers, thank you so much.